Okay, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Carl Goulet. I'm the gallery director at Five Points. Um, tonight we are joined by six of our exhibiting artists and the talk will be moderated by Ricardo Reyes. Uh, Rico oversees the activities of the Joseloff and Sophie Galleries, the Carmen Print Study um, Center, and the Art and Campus Program at the University of Hartford. Rico is an artist, a curator, and a cultural theorist. His art employs the idioms of performance, video, and installation while addressing issues of ethnicity, sexuality, global politics, and capitalist exploitation. All right, Rico, it's up to you. Thanks, Carl. Um, so today, um, we're just, I'm going to introduce the artists, and then I'm going to ask them two questions, and then we'll quickly open it up for the audience so that we can have a really good dialogue with everybody here um, participating today. The talk is being recorded, and please use the question and answer function to post your questions. Um, right? So in alphabetical order, I will start with Ethan Brewerton. He's in the Launchpad Biennial in the West Gallery. Um, Ethan received his Bachelor of Fine Arts in Drawing in 2011 from Lyme Academy of College of Arts, Fine Arts, currently a freelance illustrator whose stream of consciousness line drawings are rooted in science fiction, fantasy, and childhood musings. His work on view is simultaneously a reduction of art making to line and spaces, while also building up complex compositions that create worlds in which monsters and machines meld into each other. Second, um, Erin Cunliffe, um, she's also in the Launchpad Biennial. Um, she received her MFA in illustration from the Harvard Art School in 2020. As a freelance illustrator, Erin has been narrating the story of Arthur, a dapper, nine-eyed, green humanoid creature with a penchant for traveling and hanging out with earthlings. This work explores the artist's lived experience as a source of Arthur's own world making. Um, not with us today is uh, Arnithia Douglas, um, but I'll introduce her as well. Um, she attended, she is attending the Hartford Art School and will receive her MFA in Interdisciplinary Arts next year. Um, a printmaker and multimedia artist, me, playfully employs relief printing and patterned fabrics as a way to build texturally lush surfaces. The characters in her work are abstracted by the textures and patterns while also giving the viewers hints to their identities. In our TDP gallery, the Torrington Downtown Partners Gallery, is Sarah Allen's Grigo Ditches exhibition called Fixed State. It is a provocation of the contradictions embedded within the notions of fixity of being. The geometric armature and the sensuous folds of the clay body are manifestations of Sarah's ideas about memories, emotions, knowledge, as well as a demonstration of her agility with material. She received her BFA from the Harvard Art School and her MFA from the University of Massachusetts at Dartmouth. Sarah Sparkowski is also in the Launchpad Biennial Show. Um, she graduated from the University of Hartford in 2017. Her works collage photographs and color aid paper and graphite drawings to create composition that harkens to constructivist projects. The minimalist polygons form complex spatial configurations that allude to a distorted understanding of our surroundings. Next is Emilia Strunk. She is also in the Launchpad Biennial Show. She is a comic book artist currently working on a larger series titled Chip on the Shoulder. In the gallery, we are introduced to Kayana over several pages and get a glimpse of his struggles and the spectral presence that haunts him. Emilia graduated from the Hartford Art School in 2017 with degrees in illustration and mathematics. In our East Gallery, we have LG Talbot. Laura presents her latest work in the East Gallery. Her large canvases are imbued with energetic line work that results in the very compositional forms that suggest figures, topographies, and quotidian tools. Laura received her MA from Leslie College in Boston and in 1994 and currently lives in East Hampton, Massachusetts. 
So these are our artists. Thank you for participating. It was so much fun looking at your work, you know, all week and really getting to know it. Um, so I just basically have two questions. So my first question is, as a way to create connections between each of the artists' work currently on view, I was attracted to the employment of line and as a compositional strategy to line being a subject matter of the work. So could you talk about the importance of line in your work? Anybody want to go first? Well, I'll start since my images are up. So uh, <laughs> line is really important to me. Obviously, I use the black line. My work has changed a lot over the year. I, start, I no longer use charcoal on my canvas. I would charcoal everything out and then um, use these thick um, oil paints to put line around my figures or my images. And some of these paintings are really old and I no longer do that. I'm really getting away from the line and it's becoming a little more abstract. So it's not as important to me, but I feel like in, in some of these older paintings, the line is really prominent. And for me, a black line is really strong. And I was trying to convey that. Who would like to go next? That's, was that Sarah Sparkowski? Sure. I use some graphite lines. I think those are more so for a connection between some of the shapes and I think it contains them as well and maybe provides for a little energy in between. Them. I can jump in. If... Yeah. So um, I was thinking, you know, looking at LG's work, talking about that strength of line. I think that that's something I also think about in my own work, whether it's the two-dimensional drawings or the, the three-dimensional sculptures. So for me, line is kind of a fun balance between strength and also fragility and precariousness. Uh, I really like the idea of breaking something down to as most minimal structure as possible so that it supports the form, just thinking about balance physically as well as visually. But I do think it's really interesting that so far, you know, looking at everyone's work, seeing that, that relationship we all have with line is definitely very strong, so. <laughs> For me, I use it as a skeletal framework for the other stages of making the comics, but also it's kind of, it emphasizes shape and how a person fits into a space. It kind of brings them into reality while the panels kind of act as like windows. So uh, with my stuff, line is pretty much all I have, and it's kind of like my way to explore the surface and explore three-dimensional space and also different designs and things. And these are kind of like my way of having fun with all the stuff that I can't do in my work that I do for pay. I guess line is pretty important to me because that's all I do when I'm having fun. I think for me, line work within my art was sort of subconscious. The work that I looked at growing up, you know, I was very much so into animation and the line work of Disney because Disney was in the Renaissance when I was well, their second renaissance when I was growing up. And so I think line has always followed me in the artwork that I've made. And um, being more uh, whimsical, I think line work helps with that to sort of get into between realistic and cartoon, which I don't mind being called cartoony. That's fine. Um, so I think it's just that. I think it's just a subconscious thing. Also, I do a lot of printmaking and I think for my print work line was really important and I enjoyed the look of it so it just sort of translated through everything else. Now that's interesting I'm just going to continue this conversation about line because I think looking at Aaron's work and compared to LG's work you know like your line work is very different mm -hmm. and I feel like LG the line is the character and with Aaron you're definitely your work with the blind is really just sort of a way to contain the colors yeah. you know and I and I felt like that was a really interesting juxtaposition or just really interesting comparison of how you know how line becomes sort of you know like I said like a, a narrative element or a subjective element as opposed to a strategy to contain and I think that it all of those that kind of that kind of you know, art, you know, like art of one, on one side, it's the, it, it, is, it is what it is about. The line is what it's about. And the other side is like, the line is just to help things 
be in one place or the other. And but within everyone's work, those two extremes are functioning at the same time. And and I really I really enjoyed it, especially with Ethan. Like you know, when you have lines and lines and lines and lines, all of a sudden, like you, your eye kind of not look at lines anymore and becomes like enamored with the the spaces without lines, right? And then you fall into this cracks in the middle. So I don't know if you want to talk more about sort of a kind of extreme juxtaposition or, or kind of uh, the, the two varying elements of how line functions in, in the work. When do you know when you have enough? Um, when I stand back from it and no one spot really pushes out more than any of the others, I, I like to try and keep it kind of ambiguous so that you do kind of fall into it and you can you can get up close and you can figure out like what's attached to what and then have your world almost like flip upside down when you're you try and follow a form and then it leads into another one and it changes your perspective on where it is you came from almost like mc escher-esque i guess mm -hmm. um playing with that kind of stuff when i'm working is a lot of fun since in my paid work i just have to do like very euclidean space very uh normal space that you'd recognize mm -hmm. And Laura, do you, do you feel like there's always that moment that you're they're ne negotiating when it's like, when do I have enough line or when, when is it big enough or thick enough or, you know, because your work definitely uses the line in various energies. That comes pretty easy for me. I'm a minimalist and um, I, I don't like, I don't like a lot of form on there. I don't want too much with the line. So I'm, you know, constantly going back and making sure, I mean, even though like the painting you're showing is really, really simple, sometimes these heavy lines, getting them perfectly, uh, I don't know what I want to say, heavy handed with the paint and I, I don't know, the form and the line for me are such strong parts of my work that I'm not sure what I'm trying to convey here regarding, you know, uh, the other lines. Because I think for your work, definitely, you know, the line is the character. The line is what the painting is about. So you don't think of it as a, an element. It's just, it's the painting, right? Right. Yeah. So I'll ask my second question. Another thread that goes through the works in the galleries is the use of narration um, to, you know, talk about our contemporary situation. And there seems to be this like energy, whether it's uneasy or destabilizing, that moves the narrative forward, you know, and particularly moving the narrative from like reality to fantasy or abstraction. And do you feel like your work right now is like marking, you know, the time that we're in, or is it really an exploration of something otherworldly and other fantasy world? So I think my work deals with something that's very realistic, but then I take the images and cut them up. So then I guess they translate into something more like abstracted. So you don't exactly know what you're looking at. Um, I've drawn from some older images, um, one from a butcher shop and then one a series of gloved hands and then uh, one of a dead rabbit. So just mixing those elements and creating these flats and spaces. So I guess what I put in one of my pieces was a kind of clinical reality versus uh, folklore or almost fantasy, something that there's there's a reality to it, but then it's strained and, and it goes off the tracks and, and becomes something else when I play with those forms and shapes. And Talk more about the three elements that you play with. So just looking at I, I liked getting a lot of those shapes and forms and, and kind of dissociating almost and looking at those, the muscles as just colors and forms and textures. And, but I don't know if it was something about the lighting. I just found those groupings and I thought they worked really well together and kind of created a new vocabulary with those elements and the coloring paper as kind of subbing in for these nice flats. And do you feel like that they're those three things? I mean, I think you're telling a story with them. And, and for me, the, the fun part about looking at your work is like, I don't quite know what the story is, but I'm really intrigued, you know, because sometimes it's really obvious, like, oh, it's a, it's a dead carcass of an animal. Yeah. Sometimes it's so subtle, it's just like a wash of pink that I'm like, hmm, I don't know what this is about, so I'm going to keep looking at it. 
What about you, Aaron? The work that I have displayed, there's a consistent character. His name is Arthur. I started drawing him when I was maybe three or four. I was really into like aliens. And my grandparents had just moved to California. So he sort of took on this California stereotype very quickly. <laughs> and he's just stayed with me throughout my art making. And during my time in my MFA program through Hartford Art School, we traveled a lot. And it was sort of this commemorative way to have him travel with me. Like, where did Arthur go this time? Well, he went to San Francisco or he went to Philly or wherever it was. And, um, you know, with COVID, nobody was traveling, so he didn't either. And um, so it was just, Arthur became a way to commemorate all the things that I was doing in my life, whether it was traveling or being in quarantine. But I kind of go in between what could be realistic. Like I want Arthur to always feel like he could be in the world we live in. And even though he's a nine-eyed green alien, it's just sort of a juxtaposition between what's reality, what isn't, and kind of like the little devil on your shoulder or angel, depending on the day. I guess that's what Arthur is, <laughs> so. So do you feel like the narrative in, with Arthur is really sort of, he's sort of your avatar? Is that too close? Or is he just really like, you know, loosely based on your life? I think he's more of a companion. I did a lot of solo traveling for these contact periods and he was sort of, you know, just with me. I don't think he was me, but I think he was just with me all the time. And it was easier to make believe I was documenting his life than mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like, he's, Go ahead. sounds like he's almost documenting your life. Maybe. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. He's documenting my life in a way that um, makes it seem more interesting, I think. <laughs> I'm going to go to Emilia because, you know, she uses sort of the same kind of narrative technique with, uh, with her, co her web comics. And Kayana is, is an interesting character that you've developed. So talk about more about that and like how, you know, how the character and your narrative content really develops. Uh, is he also based on your life? <laughs> um, I think it's um, more based on the theme. Uh, his life is very different from mine, but um, he has the same kind of issues that I sort of deal with in that. I don't know, reaching out to people's kind of tough. Um, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't know how it got there exactly, but. Uh, sure, I mean, it's, if you have a chance, I would suggest that you follow Amelia's work on tapas.io, right? And because um, she has other panels. So if you're not in the gallery seeing the different panels, the story is, again, quite interesting. And, you know, it's a, it's a guy who has a, a ghost following or stuck with him. Um, and, you know, we're seeing just a little bit of the story, but the, what, what we've already seen is really interesting. And so definitely um, look into that. Um, but Ethan, let's, I think Ethan, Sarah P and, um, and Laura's work, you know, kind of function in the same way where it's the narrative content is sort of within the structure of the pieces. Um, so maybe Ethan start with yours in terms of, you know, because you're, you're still sort of narrating this machine monster storyline, right? I, I guess you could, you could say it that way. Like the, the biggest way that I see narrative um, being associated with my work is more like um, my sub, what my subconscious is interested in for the time that I'm producing that work. Um, because when I make that work, I'm, very, I'm doing it very almost mindlessly, but 
with keeping in mind like the composition. Um, like these are as abstract as I can really get myself to be. Um, and uh, it, it's kind of, maybe there's things in there that I'm trying to work out. I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, don't, I don't really think about them at all when I'm making them other than like, that I really like this shape next to this shape next to this shape. And I like how it's forming the rest of the composition on the canvas um, or panel or paper, or whatever it happens to be. Um, and those decisions are probably affected by things that are happening to me in the real world. Okay. And what about you, Sarah P? Sure, yeah, I think my work is also pretty abstract. Um, and But there's these, these sort of recognizable elements in them that I'm hoping tie back to some kind of story or um, you know, maybe a memory or something. So I think there's definitely a narrative aspect, just sort of like the title of my show of being fixed state. Um, this idea is, my hope is that the sculptures are, are sort of like a frozen moment in time, which is something that ceramics lends itself to pretty well, where you can get like a gesture or a fold in the material really, um, you know, there's an immediacy there and then it just becomes completely permanent and frozen and so that's something that i find really interesting with the material and um it's a way to document a time period or a memory or um, an event perhaps so so they're definitely abstracted but my hope is that you know they they have this this moment of a story or a moment of a memory um for some of them they're personal and my but my biggest hope is that they have a kind of global or, you know, everyone can look at them and, and sort of finish the story into their own life or apply it to their own experiences. So that's my goal is that there's, just, there's enough recognizable information there so that it's relatable to everybody and not just wherever they're coming from, my own, my own ideas. But um, I think that, you know, a lot of my work is about, because part of your question is like, are you marking time right now, like this contemporary time that we're in? And I don't know if I'm, I think in a way I am, just in that I hope there's this global experience that can be applied to it. Um, a lot of my work's about like, you know, the downtrodden or the derelicts, like these, these forgotten spaces, these forgotten people maybe who live in those spaces or used to live in those spaces, that kind of residue of a memory in a place. Um, so I, I love the idea of kind of like showing these as works of art, um, kind of like I love to show them in a gallery and the more white cube the gallery, the better. There's a sense of sort of like subverting that <laughs> gallery space and, and putting these little piles of like tender trash on a pedestal. Um, and I don't know, to me, that's, that's great. Like I like the idea of, of elevating these things and, and talking about like the reality of these things that maybe resent people or places or, or um, you know, those who are struggling or have dealt with struggle and just like, bringing it up into this like art sense or this, this elevated sense, um, so to speak, you know, but um, so that's, that's where I think story comes into mind since they are, they are pretty abstracted, but there's just that, hopefully that human connection as well. When I, I I'm really drawn to the ceramic wood pieces, the sculptural pieces and um, they, you know, they remind me of how the Statue of Liberty was built. You know, sort of like seeing, yeah. uh, seeing the historic photographs of how the Statue of Liberty came to be, you know, with this like really rigid, you know, iron armature. And then all of a sudden the hammered copper on top with this sensuous flow. So when I first looked at it, I was like, I don't know why, but it's like Statue of Liberty. <laughs> That's gotta be the first time I've ever heard that, but I like it. <laughs> You know, because it's like, it has this, like, the sensuousness of the clay body, and then you juxtapose it with this kind of armature, you know, mm -hmm. and, you never, I, I, and then, then you play with it. Like, you never quite, you're never quite sure, you know, what's supporting what. And so for me, so I, I, again, it's like one of these, it's like, I have to keep looking at it. I keep looking at how it's supported, how it's flowing, how it's sitting there, and then how you, you know, how you really play with the, sort of, you know, the rigidity of the, of the wood and then sort of the sensuousness of the clay. And then, you know, then I feel like there has to be a story somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Definitely, so, yeah. 
Definitely, yeah. So I think that, that you know, I think we can excavate this your work a little bit more. I feel I feel the same way with Laura's work. Like I feel like there's a story behind every painting, and and like. <laughs> <laughs> because your titles, your titles allude to it, you know, you know, even yeah. though they're kind of short, um, but I still feel like, okay, running figure, mm. <laughs> there must be something about this figure that comes up because all your other work are seems so abstraction, abstracted, right? Then all of a sudden you get a figure. Yep. So how does this figure relate to all the other pieces? Well, can I answer your question? Yes, 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 please. <laughs> so, so the painting Doomsday, um, that's the one that's figurative that I just did in 2020. Obviously, the person is wearing a gas mask. And at the same time, I don't know if anyone noticed a lot of these paintings that I titled the show Hands Up. And mm -hmm. um, I'm not a political artist, but I really felt during um, our, our last presidency, I just got more and more um, involved in what was happening uh, specifically to the black community. So I did paintings that were about, you know, hands up, hands up, and what it's like to be a white person with privilege. And out of this came hands in, uh, you know, the, the one hand looks like it's also another hand with toppling, the building's kind of falling down. So I don't know if you can see, it's kind of an architectural building. Mm -hmm. And so for me, this was a, you know, as much as I'm not a political person, it was seeping into my work mm -hmm. in, you know, in, a, in an abstract way that I, I had to um, confront. So uh, a lot of hands and then the gas mask and just kind of figuring out you know what what the work was about but yeah it was all, it's all stories i think you're right it's stories about where i was at this moment i feel like i've already moved on from that and i'm in a different place we can all breathe now <laughs> <laughs> but isn't it funny how like you know the the moment of time that we're in is it's like it's so embedded and manifested through our work you know like like I think every that's why I think everyone's work here has sort of reflects the the moment of time, and I think that you know yours definitely you know like maybe you shared the background story you know it definitely feels like wow I'm definitely looking at this quite differently because before I mean you know it was really to me I was looking at like oh it's kind of like topographical it's like a marina or a park or parking lot you know like there's like this kind of like aerial view that I'm feeling. Yeah. But now that you say that they're hands, it completely changes my understanding of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. So we have, um, again, for the audience who are joining us on, on Zoom, please um, type in your, your question in the chat or the Q&A. We have one question right now. Um, this is a question for Ms. Talbot. Can you talk a bit about why you include your name in the work? Um, I don't always uh, put my last name on the paintings. It really depends on each piece of work. Sometimes I just don't feel like it should, my name should be on a painting. And sometimes I do. So, um, and really that's it. There's some mm -hmm. paintings I think are so strong without the name. And then sometimes I just want to put my name on there. So I don't have any rhyme or reason to that. <laughs> <laughs> Hope that answers your question. So does anybody from the panel want to ask anybody else a question? It's harder not being in the gallery. I'm trying to look through everybody's stuff now. I took for granted that we had the screen share going. You want me to screen share again? Does that help? No, I'm, I'm looking uh, right now. There was a question for me. Um, okay, yeah, go ahead. In the chat. So asking to talk more about the narrative of my work. Is there a specific, <laughs> a specific question or, um, I, I don't know. I could maybe I was thinking something that came up when Rico was talking about the Statue of Liberty um, 
this idea of looking at architecture is really important to me and it's something that I do a lot of. So I, I loved that comparison to the Statue of Liberty when it was being built. Um, and I, I mean, like, I'm always taking photos of like people's DIY jobs or like building sites or you know construction sites I love it I love the linear elements I love um like I have some great photos of just like an entire it's like a three-decker in Boston area right and there's just like two two by fours holding up <laughs> like it what looks like the entire front of the building I think it's just some sort of awning or porch but I just I love uh looking at those kinds of visuals um and I think that there's just so much tension and stress, like especially a picture like that of a building being held up by a stick. Um, but like we feel that when we look at it. So I'm always interested in like, how can I capture that feeling um, and put it into an object? So that, that's what I always find interesting. I think all of us here as art makers, it's like what we do is a form of visual communication where we're talking to people without words, you know, or without writing words or speaking them, we're, we're still communicating. So I just love, how can I how can I take a feeling that I'm having or that someone's having and distill that into like this pile of stuff and and maybe hopefully people feel the same way when they look at it. So um, it's a little bit about narrative, I, more process or inspiration. I don't know. Yeah, and for me, narrative is not necessarily the story that you tell, but it's really like the content that's in the work, whether it is a story in itself or whether it's your ideas or emotion. Right? These are all of these elements tell a story of some sort. So, I mean, narrative for me is a really broad, um, really broad idea. Um, so there's another question to all, who are your biggest inspirations, art world or otherwise? So let's start with Erin. Uh, okay. Um, for me, I obviously look at a lot of illustrators. Um, I, I mean, Dr. Seuss, as silly as it sounds, um, was a big reason that I wanted to make art. I thought that it was the greatest thing, that he got paid to make pictures for books. I thought it was brilliant. And um, like I mentioned before, like animation has played a big role in how I create, I think. Um, but besides illustrators and animation, um, I do look at a lot of like fine art history I really love Rembrandt and um, that era of art. So, um, yeah, it's kind of everywhere for me. Dr. Seuss and Rembrandt, that's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, um, in a nutshell. Yeah. Dr. Seuss and Rembrandt. Yeah. Um, I mean, my, my inspiration comes from everywhere. Uh, like, I, I look at a lot of heavy machinery a lot. So like that seeps in. Monsters I've always been into. Specifically like artists, like comic artists that were big in the 90s. So like Jim Lee, Greg Capullo, Todd McFarlane. Um, I, I went to a very classical school. So like a lot of Baroque painters, um, but, and draftsmen obviously. Uh, but uh, not there, I would say like, The thing that got me to start making this work was um, a friend of mine asked me, what, what would you draw if you didn't know what the end result was gonna be? And somehow that like unlocked something in me. So I would say that my friend Wes, big inspiration for this stuff, um, because I never would have made it if he never asked me that question. And now it's like what I do for fun, so. Cool. Thanks, Wes. <laughs> Amelia. What is your biggest inspiration in the art world or otherwise? Um, it's kind of hard to pinpoint something, but I, I've also watched a lot of animation stuff and I read a lot of web comics, so I think a lot of that stuff kind of bleeds into my work. Is there a particular comic book artist that you follow? Or a story that you like? I, I think, 
I really like um, work by Junji Ito, but yeah, I <laughs> like horror stuff and stuff like that, so. But your work is not particularly like in the horror genre. No. Like, it's not gory and it's not like monsters, you know, it's like, it's really this, this like kind of nice quiet guy. Yeah. Um, so that's, for me, it's interesting that you, you reference horror in your work, but it's not, but we don't see that immediately. Yeah. I, I like, it, it hasn't shown yet, but I like kind of doing <laughs> something <coming> subtle. <laughs> yeah, it's coming. Okay. <laughs> Sarah S. Um, Maybe inspiration and in art in the art world or otherwise. Well, I, I have to say, my classmates a lot of the time and and at UHart, um, I was just like blown away by what people were making, and I'm like, oh, I want to try this or that, or during crits, you're like, you're like, well, why didn't you put this over here? And it was just incredible support, and I just. I go in the gallery now and still I'm just like, oh my God, I wonder if I do this in this way because I'm inspired by these guys. So it's a lot more, I guess, local rather than, um, well, I do like Suko, but rather than someone like super well known, I, I have to feed off of the energy that I'm around and I'm around these guys and it's incredible. So that's who I'm inspired by. Cool, Laura. Um, I'm inspired by architecture, graphic design, modern cars, classic cars, Porsches, the line. Again, um, a lot of things, I, I live in art museums, but I also live in every other kind of museum. So every, the world, like traveling, what I see, what my eye sees. I'm not, you know, a lot of people say, oh, your stuff is like Keith Haring. And I'm like, yeah, I like Keith Haring, but I'm not trying to, you know copy one person. I'm really influenced by so many just worldly, worldly things. I, I want you to talk about one specific piece that I've seen of yours. And it's, I think it's called um, Keith Haring with a little bit Basquiat. It's an older painting. I, are you frozen, Laura? I think she is. All right. We'll come back to you. Um, so, the, oh, Sarah, yes, I'm oh, sorry, Pete. Inspiration, but, did you do that? Yeah, I think I, I sort of mentioned some of them, but I'm, I'm like Laura, just, I'm inspired by architecture a lot. Um, you know, I love, I love art history and um, looking back at, you know, contemporary artists and historical artists as well, but um, I just love looking at architecture. I love looking at also um, machine, you know, like engine manuals and <laughs> things were, parts are moving together and making sense. And I like to break them apart and have them not make sense. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just draw a lot of inspiration from like good design. I'm always inspired by good design. Um, and I always, try, I always notice bad design, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a fun hobby of identifying bad, bad design. And um, yeah, I don't know, other artists, like Anne Hamilton's a big one for me. A lot of fiber artists, even though I work in clay, because I think my work is a lot like fabric. <laughs> So I'm just inspired by the use of material, um, and yeah. No, I, I, I see your fascination with fabric because I feel like your clay work is definitely, you're trying to flow in that. And um, one thing that I'm always interested to see in clay work is sort of the emulation of how um, fabric wrinkles. And when I, see that in, when I see that in clay, it's like, that is skill. And I think you, you definitely play with that as well in your work, because the way that different things fold and different things crease has that, it has a language of like folded fabric. Yeah, I just make piles of laundry, but it's dirty laundry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think, I, I know I, as a ceramic artist, I look to a lot of people in my field and a lot of techniques, but I'm, I'm by no means a purist. Um, you know, I, I don't limit myself to one material, I think. Every material you choose is just another, again, part of that vocabulary. Um, so everything has different meaning, different connotations. So if you're using concrete with ceramics versus little twigs of wood versus in ceramic, you know, it's, it's saying two completely different things. 
So, um, but yeah, it's, it's fun to fold clay and, you know, get those gestures kind of trapped and frozen, which is what I'm hoping to do. Cool. We have one, um, another question on the chat. It says to Ethan, what is your commercial work like and how does it connect with your fun work? So, um, I would say, so for my commercial work, I do a lot of line work still, um, but I also do some color stuff. I do a lot of like characters. Um, right now I'm working on like a fantasy comic for a client um, where my mechanical stuff doesn't really come up that much. Um, though a lot, of, a lot of what I'm doing in my uh, more fine art stuff where I do this, I call it mecha doodling. Um, it, it's helped me like de-stress very complicated scenarios. Like if I'm drawing a pile of junk, I can kind of just like start making junk and just keep adding to it until it looks very complicated and uh, like it's supposed to within the story. Um, and that doesn't stress me out as much anymore. Or like doing a, before making any kind of mechanical thing used to terrify me. And then uh, that one day I woke up and I, after I was asked that question and I started drawing these things and now they're much more accessible to me. So it's kind of like a play back and forth a lot of times where it's like, I'll be playing around and discover something that I can use in my commercial work and then vice versa. Um, like I'll be studying something for my commercial work that'll then pop up in my, for fun work. Um, but yeah, I guess hopefully that answers your question. Well, actually I want to ask everybody, do you all, do you all have sort of different branches of your practice? Do you have a, commission commercial work versus the stuff that you do all the time? I, sure. Not really. I, I think all of it kind of looks the same. It's just different subjects. Mm, okay. so I think the last one I did was a kid's book for a family and it looked the same, but it was definitely, it definitely didn't have an alien in it. We'll go with that word, it, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But I try to keep everything pretty consistent, I think. I make pottery sometimes, <laughs> but that's not really, uh, and I'm not by commission or anything, but I, I teach ceramic, I teach pottery. So um, I'm a sculptor by nature, but also trained on the, the functional work. Anybody else? So um, we have a, a 10 minutes left and I wanted to do something like really quick and fun, maybe kind of a lightning round question. So really just off the cuff and um, you know, just whatever pops in your head. And then they'll be silly, you know, they'll be like simple questions. They're not gonna be difficult. So um, I wanna start with what is your favorite material? single material? Yeah, like the one that you always use. Pen. Okay. <laughs> uh, iPad. Okay. What was that, Amelia? Paper. Paper. <laughs> Play. Paper. Paper. Oh, wow. Okay. Next question. Um, your favorite color? Purple. Same. Purple. <laughs> Green. Teal. Teal. Well, Sarah, as did you say something? I didn't oh, care. It was purple, same as. Purple, okay. Purple also. Lots of purple. Clearly the um, best color. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Um, Studio practice versus working in another room of the house. <laughs> like, where did, like, where do you end up really working? Um, in bed most of the time. Yeah. I'll work anywhere as long as I have the tools necessary. Like, like I worked in the gallery, work in my studio, work from home. I, and if this was in person. Uh, you would see me with my, my sketchbook and I'd be working. Yeah. 
Amelia? Oh, yeah. Uh, same as Aaron, just in, in bed? <laughs> somewhere comfy. Okay. Sarah, S? Uh, usually at home, but I'd probably get more done if it was in the studio. And Sarah, on? Um, see, I think I split my time. I have a home studio, just like a little room that I work in. And then I have, you know, studio with like kilns and stuff that work. So combination. <laughs> yeah, I always ask that question because I feel like, you know, like, if we want to be professional, we work in the studio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, most of the time I end up like, you know, at the kitchen table, like yeah. doing stuff. And that's where the real work happens. So, oh, that's yeah. We have another question to all. Where do you see your work going next? No I, guess, I guess I'll start. Um, I want to play more around with the metallic pens, but I also want to play around with like marking off certain areas of the surface that I'm working on and then doing a different color or tone and maybe even switching up my, my shape language within those sectioned off areas. Uh, and see what I can do there. Okay. Anybody else? Um, I've sort of been working more on like visual development lately. Um, what does that mean? So the elements that go into building a world or something, so building characters, building environments, objects that you find in the environments, that sort of thing. So. A little less um, compositional, but it's been fun. And next, <laughs> yeah. Um, right now, I'm doing the online web comic thing, so hopefully, I can get it into a book. Yeah. Yeah. Is it a graphic novel or a series of comics? Um, I think it would be a graphic novel. Cool, cool. Okay. With two Sarahs again, I'll, I'll go. Um, <laughs> I think my work is, um, it's just a, con it's always sort of a continuation of, of what I'm working on and just developing my ideas. But I've, I've started using different materials. So I think I have one piece in the show, the gallery with, with hydrocal, which is like a plaster material. So mm -hmm. that's been something, I actually started using it mostly during COVID because I was at home and plaster is a quick and easy way to work in a bedroom at your house. So um, that's, that's where it started and then I've been having fun with that. So new materials. Sarah so, yes. Um, I'd like to go a little more like, I'd like to go sculptural. I feel like a lot of my elements have, uh, or my, a lot of my pieces have sculptural elements, and I'd like to try and actually go and work maybe with clay or um, build an armature or something and, and play with that, yeah. Cool. So we have another question from the panelists, or for the chat. Um, what did you learn in art school that continues to inform your work today? I'll go. Okay. So, um, I had a professor in undergrad that said, I guess it was mainly towards illustrators, but I think it applies to everyone that um, you always have to have a side project that makes making everything else easier because you get to have this break where you're just doing something that's solely for you. Nobody in the world ever has to see it, but it makes you grow for everything else that the world will see. So I think that was the best advice. Great. Something, something I learned um, at Harvard Art School, which it's been, I think, 11 years since I graduated, which is crazy. Um, but I love that so many of us have, are from this Hartford community. But I learned from someone who I think still teaches there. He said to me, make now, edit later. And that's something I always mm -hmm. say and tell my students, and I think about it all the time. Don't worry about it in the moment, but, um, you know, you can judge it later. <laughs> Just keep making. Um, so I think, I think the biggest thing that 
I learned in art school is how to how to receive criticism mm. and like not not to take all of it you kind of have to like parse it and figure out the kind of feedback that you're looking for um, if it's coming from all directions you need to like put on blinders and not see the parts that you're not interested in um, because otherwise you'll just be pulled in a million different directions and you'll just come apart so yeah. definitely Amelia or Sarah? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I think one of the pieces of advice I, I like, I think John said this, but always have, like with Aaron, several projects going on so that if you run into a roadblock, then you can move on. And then, or if you learn something from that other project, then you can go and bounce back um, to, the, to the next one, which is really helpful. And Amelia. Really have anything specific in mind? Um, I know one of my teachers recommended a book to me that was really helpful before about making comics. Hmm. Sure, great. So for the rest of the time, I just wanted to, you know, invite people, like, do you have any last words about, you know, the work in the gallery? Something that we didn't cover? So I have a quick, weird question for you, Aaron. You yeah. said you've been drawing Arthur since you were three. Yep. And I had a similar character that I've been drawing since I, I was eight, and I used very similarly throughout art, art school to, like, practice different things and, like, get better at different yeah. medium or whatever. And for me, it always felt like, like seeing a, a, an old friend whenever I would draw him. Yeah. Is it similar? Yeah, definitely. I think it, it, yeah, that's the best way to describe it. It's like a companion through life. Like we've grown up together. Right. And like he's evolved. And obviously as you grow up as a person, you evolve. And so yeah, I think that's the best way to describe it. Old friend. Cool. Yeah. Be yeah, before we end, I just want to remind everybody who is um, watching in that the three shows, Five Points Launch Card Biennial, it's in the West Gallery, Hands Up by LG Talbot is in the East Gallery, and the TDP Gallery, we have Fixed State by Sarah Allen Frigodich, and they're all ending on June 26th. So please go to to Five Points Gallery, downtown Torrington, and see this show, it's fantastic. Um, and again, you know, like, make sure that you um, visit frequently, visit the website, and come by and see, see what's going on. Besides the gallery, there's also the annex, and there's also the um, Center for the Arts up, in the, uh, up at the hill. So, and that will open hopefully quite soon to the public. So there is a lot to do in Western Connecticut. So please don't be a stranger, come back for five, five points. Um, and again, I want to thank the panelists. Thank you, everybody. This has been a really great conversation and um, I wish we had more time and we could really dig into the work, um, but definitely, you know, uh, it was really fun to talk with everybody. And thank you to all the participants who um, joined us tonight. So thank you, everybody. Thanks.